Well, hello, friends. Welcome to Quick Step for this week. Just wanted to give a shout out for this awesome birthday present from my buddy Melinda, who made this cross stitch. Maybe, maybe if I can just tweak a little bit higher, you can see the step back cross stitch. Pretty cool. So, uh, also, I have to apologize because this video is a little bit late. Uh, life is still chaotic and crazy for me, so please have patience while I work things out. Hopefully, this will be the only week where this happens. But, you know, the occasional mistake might be made. So the big story this week, I mean, there are so many. There's the fact that Russia and Ukraine look like they are at the brink of war, which would be a huge geopolitical disaster. But uh, that still is cooking. And I think that that might be, if it's still in the news, next week's video. But today I want to talk about weapons of mass destruction. Or specifically chemical weapons and the Geneva Accord and... The fact that the United States might have actually committed an act of war this week. Well, last weekend. So if you guys have been following the news during the election earlier this month, there was talk about something called the Caravan. A group of people from Central America who are trying to get to the United States in order to apply for asylum. The media spun this as illegal immigration. The Republicans definitely spun it as illegal immigration. They sent troops to the border. It was a whole shit show. But then the election was over and everyone thought that maybe we'd move on. Maybe we would just, you know, handle this in some sort of normal fashion. But no, the United States had a very normal one and fired canisters of tear gas at this group of asylum seekers, including children. And one important aspect that came out of this, there are so many uh, horrible breaches of international law in this action one of the big ones is uh, breaking the Geneva Convention, specifically the one signed in 1992 that was designed to ban the use of chemical weapons, including tear gas, which is what was used. So chemical weapons are whenever you use the toxic or caustic aspects of a chemical in order to commit warfare. You can see this as far back as ancient claims of, you know, poisoning weapons in order to go into combat. This has shown up in ancient Greece, showed up in ancient India. The Chinese used smoke that was laced with arsenic in order to poison their opponents back, like, three over 3,000 years ago. I think there was even a dynasty in China that burned toxic plants and, like, used bellows to push their smoke over to the enemy. Even during a war between the Romans and the Persians, the Persians used a mix of bitumen, which is like oil, sand, and sulfur crystals in order to make sulfur dioxide and actually managed to kill a number of Roman soldiers with this gas attack in the classical age. And yeah, you did see throughout, even in like the Crimean War, throughout the early modern period, 19th century, everything, you found the increasing use of industrialized chemical warfare. I think the most infamous you probably would remember is the First World War, which just turned 100 years old. Even though the Hague Declaration of 1899 banned the use of chemical weapons, both sides used them in World War I. And in World War II, the Axis used it, specifically the Japanese and infamously the Germans, but the Allies didn't use it, although they had plans to, they just kind of never got around to it. Anyways, after the war, it's been considered pretty uncouth to use chemical weapons in warfare. Hence why when Saddam Hussein used chemical weapons against the Kurds, it was considered a horrible breach of international norms. When Bashar al-Assad used chemical weapons against his own people, although that one's a little bit disputed, but let's just go for the sake of argument that he used them. There was also an international outcry. And of course, who could forget the use of Zyklon B against Jews during the Holocaust in order to be a instrument of mass genocide. Anyways, under the Geneva Protocol, the rules of warfare were strengthened in the 90s in order to basically say that the use of chemical weapons is forbidden in warfare. That being said, every country still has huge stockpiles of them, so don't expect it to go away anytime soon. They're cheap to make and they do a lot of damage. That's sort of the point of them. The reason why they violate international law is because they're what's called a weapon of mass destruction, which is a weapon that can't be mechanically separated from a different type of weapon that has by its very cause the capacity to kill, maim, or injure large amounts of people or destroy a lot of territory. 
This is things like nuclear weapons. This is things like biological weapons and chemical weapons definitely fall under this purview. They're indiscriminate. They're hard to control and get into the right place at the right time. And in the case of a lot of these gases, especially the more deadly ones like chlorine gas or mustard gas can be very deadly. Now let's talk about tear gas. The tear gas used by the Border Patrol in the United States against these men, women, and children were non-lethal. These are the ones you typically see used on any people who dare to protest in the United States and around the world. Tear gas, while banned in warfare, can still be used against your own people, and they often are. Tear gas, or mace, is called that because it's a chemical that activates a nerve in your eye that activates your tear ducts. It can actually be made out of several things including capsaicin, which is the chemical that makes things spicy. So pepper spray is often made with capsaicin chemical taken from the peppers. That's why in the very, very dog whistly term that uh, a Republican tried to use to defend the use of tear gas on children was that this stuff could be put on your taco. Stay classy, Republicans. But yes, these chemicals can cause eye irritation, bleeding, you know, eye bleeding, they can cause inflammation and even temporary blindness. And because it's not so much a gas as it is a powder, the powder itself can get stuck on your skin or in your clothes. And if you don't properly wash it all off, uh, it could come back later once you've even gotten out of the cloud, if you will. They're also fired in these high pressure cartridges into crowds, which have on several occasions, and the police definitely know this and use it to their advantage, when they get hit by a canister, people can be severely injured, even killed. And like all quote-unquote non-lethal weapons, they're still very dangerous. If somebody is hit with tear gas and they have some sort of lung disorder, like say asthma, they will likely need to be hospitalized for the injuries that they're going to get due to the asthma attack that's going to be sparked by their being exposed to tear gas. Tear gas can also actually scar your corneas and give you permanent vision loss. And I do have to say that tear gas is way more dangerous with children. They have a much higher chance of having serious respiratory illnesses because of it. And on top of that, because children are shorter, they're closer to the ground, which means like, as I said, this is like a powder that sort of emanates off the ground. So they actually get a higher concentration of tear gas because of how short they are. So yeah, this was not an advisable action to say the least. Not only is this stuff dangerous, but the United States Border Patrol fired these canisters, these weapons, into another country. These asylum seekers weren't in the United States yet, and they were firing it into Mexico, which is technically an act of war. So I'd be interested to see how the UN is going to react to this whole situation. I imagine this attack on asylum seekers in another country using weapons of mass destruction, technically, is not going to go down well with them. This is the most obvious war crime the United States has committed in recent memory, and they've committed a lot of war crimes in recent memory. Because keep in mind, these weren't even illegally migrating people. These were people escaping drug violence in their home countries in order to get to the United States and ask for asylum, which if you go to the immigration website for the United States and look at what the first thing you need to do is in order to uh, apply for asylum is get to the United States. This was not some illegal action. Anytime I get criticism for calling the racist bigotry against Latinx people under the guise of immigration reform, uh, I usually get this angry comment from, you know, chuds on the internet who would say that, oh, it's not about immigration, it's about illegal immigration. These people are legally trying to get into the United States for their own safety. And now the Trump administration is trying to change the rules so that they can violate all of the international agreements that the United States has signed since World War II in order to ban these refugees from trying to get into the country. Gosh, that sounds a lot like something that the United States did in the 30s, too. Not to single them out. Canada did it and the rest of the world did it. But yeah, doesn't this sound a lot like when there were Jewish refugees trying to get into any country that would take them and nobody said yes. Except Mexico, actually. Kudos, Mexico. So yeah, we've got a violation of Mexico's borders. We've got a violation of the Geneva Convention. And we've got the firing of tear gas at children. And all of this against people who are trying to legally enter the United States. 
there's still another addendum to this story. I can't believe I had to say that. So Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, one of my favorite American politicians right now, called out and said, yeah, this has a lot of similarities to the Holocaust. You know, because it very obviously does. And Lindsey Graham, being one of the people who has had to become basically a Cirque du Soleil performer in his flexibility in order to defend the Trump administration, tried to say, oh, you're going to debase the Holocaust by comparing it to this thing. In which case the Auschwitz Museum actually responded to him saying, no, the Holocaust didn't just like pop out of the ground fully formed. It was a thing that developed and thing incidents like what happened at the Mexican border this week are perfect examples of the types of escalations that lead to genocide. Oh boy. So in the comments, I often get people who say I just call everyone I disagree with fascists just because they agree with fascists and do fascist things. I guess in the minds of some people, people who might be squeamish about being called fascists just because they act exactly like fascists, they seem to think that the only way to be a fascist is to like literally have a swastika on your arm and literally be Hitler. Like there's no other context in which it's possible. But this is exactly what fascists do. And if I can't call this fascism, what can you call it? If you wanna see an interesting video about the link between the Trump administration, the way that Donald Trump himself acts, and the sort of instincts of fascist dictators, I will point you to this video from Some More News. Pretty good channel, you should probably follow it. And also on December 8th, if you're in Toronto, we're gonna to have another meetup with me, Thought Slime, and Mexi. So if you go down to the comments, I'm gonna have a pinned comment giving you details. All right, everybody. Bye.